Today marks the start of the Advent season, a time of preparation, a time of, of making ourselves ready for that great feast of Christmas that is to come towards the end of the month, uh, that coming of Christ to the world, the Redeemer, the Messiah. And we find with the spirit of casting off darkness, that's what the world was in as a state during that time of preparation before Christ came the first time. It was in total darkness. It was completely devolved in sin. Man did not have the state of grace because he had lost it in the garden. Yet God loved man so much that he would send that promised Redeemer. He would save mankind by Christ becoming man and dying for our sins. We, with those people who were before Christ, we wait for the Redeemer to come in a spiritual sense. We look in expectation to that day of Christmas, waiting for the divine light to come again into this world. And every year, we commemorate that feast of Christmas with great solemnity, with great joy, with great rejoicing at that happy day. But equally, we must not forget why Christ had to come in the first place. Why we needed Christmas. Because it was due to sin that Christ had to come. It was as the exalted prayer on the, the vigil of Easter says, it was that happy fault. It was a sin, it was a grave offense against God committed by Adam and Eve in the garden. However, we have that joy of Christmas because sin came into the world in the first place. And today, the world around us, and yes, even our own selves, we still tend towards that darkness. We're still drawn to that sin. And it, and it brings us in, and it's our natural inclination to fall into that, to fall into sin again. And so while we anxiously await that great feast of the Nativity, we should also look at what we can do to better facilitate our own souls in that spirit of rejoicing when it comes, and how we can shun off that darkness of sin that exists around every one of us looming around the corner. What is the greatest cause for the loss of souls? Many people have different thoughts as to what thing it might be, but I know the answer for sure. The greatest cause of loss of soul is mortal sin. 100% attrition rate for the souls that die in that state. Mortal sin is the greatest evil in all of the world. And it truly is the only cause of the loss of souls. And it's for that reason that St. Leonard of Port Maurice, whom St. Alphonsus Liguori called the greatest apostle of the 18th century, said that his greatest obstacle in all his endeavors and all the preaching that he did throughout the entire uh, country of Italy, his greatest obstacle that stood in his way was that of man's inclination towards mortal sin. And it's for that reason that we better understand what exactly constitutes mortal sin and how we overcome. First off, what is mortal sin? We start off, sin in general is offense against God. And there, of course, as we learned in our catechism, two types of sin, mortal sin and venial sin. Venial sin is the lesser of the two. Venial sin wounds our souls. It d dims our light. But it does not make us an enemy of God. It does not kill the soul, and it does not cause us to lose heaven. Still an offense, but not a, t a terrible offense. Mortal sin kills the soul. One mortal sin is enough to snuff out all of the light of grace within us. 
And that grave offense of God causes us, against God, causes us the loss of all the good things of God as a whole. We lose out on paradise due to mortal sin. What is necessary in order for a sin to be mortal? First off, it has to be a point of grave matter. That means, in and of itself, the offense given to God is something that is serious. It's not just a minor infraction of the laws of God, but rather a grave, a, a great offense given. It's something that is a, a, a deliberate action that uh, that goes contrary to the laws of God, and that happens really in three ways. The first way, the most obvious way, is an offense against the laws of God itself. When we go directly against one of the Ten Commandments, and we do so in a very blunt and serious way. If I violate the Fifth Commandment and I kill somebody, that's a mortal sin, that's a grave offense against the Fifth Commandment, it goes directly against the commandment itself. If I steal from somebody in a large sum of money, then that's a, a direct offense against the Seventh Commandment. And it is something that is serious by its own effect. And so that type of example, a, a direct and serious sin against the commandment itself. The second way a matter can be grave is, it, is if it is against the purpose of the law that is laid down. So whether it be against the purpose of the commandments or the purpose of the laws given by the church. So one would be, for instance, a grave sin if we receive communion, having eaten within the time of that that we're supposed to be fasting for communion, so within that three-hour time period before communion, if we were to eat solid food and to do so deliberately, that would be a grave offense. Why? Because we completely throw off the entire spirit of the laws laid down, which is for the, the, the things that are necessary for a good reception of our Lord in, in a Holy Communion, and we disregard it completely, and we violate that spirit of the laws given by God through his church. Or it's against the purpose of the law anytime we have direct malice against the law when we when we when we disregard the law not out of weakness or out of carelessness but out of hatred for the law itself the third way that a sin can be great is via circumstance and that would be something according to this line that we steal a small amount which is not in and itself great but we take that small amount from a very poor person, thus causing great harm to the individual. And so by circumstance, we commit a grave offense there. The second thing necessary for a mortal sin is the full knowledge of the sinfulness of the action. We have to know that something is sinful in order for it to be a, sin, a grave sin. And in that, we cannot excuse ourselves by willful ignorance. We cannot claim to be ignorant if we don't take the normal measures in our life in order to clear up the confusion that's there. Yes, there are some things that are, you know, there are some aspects of ignorance that truly do apply where we take extraordinary means or an impossibility of clearing up that ignorance. But if I think for my, to myself, well, gee, it's, uh, it might be Friday today. And I don't know if I should eat meat or not because I don't know if it's Friday. And all I have to do is look at the calendar to figure out what day it is. That's a normal means of clearing up that ignorance. And I'm responsible for that. So I have to clear up the normal ignorance. The willful, uh, willfully ignorant does not excuse me. Um, and... It's important to realize, too, that the things that violate the Ten Commandments, those parts of God's law are ingrained on every man's heart. And so things like you know, committing murder or stealing or, or direct acts of, against purity and things like that, those are, are common to every man, whether he's trained in the catechism and the truths of God or not. He knows better. 
That's, that's why it, we see that across every aspect of humanity as always being something that is wrong. And the third part is full consent. We have to will the evil action that is done. It can't be that I do something accidentally and have it be a sin. Or I can't do something where I am in a, a state where I don't know completely what's going on and have it be a sin. So for instance, a person who has has really violently angry thoughts against his neighbor in a dream is not guilty of that violence and anger because it was in a state where he didn't have control of his will. And all three of those aspects, grave matter, full knowledge, and full consent, must be present in order for it to be an immortal sin. If one is lacking, it may be venially sinful or may be not sinful at all, depending on the circumstances, but it's only when all three are present that it is a mortal sin. But if they are present, then that is exactly what we commit, a grave sin, a mortal sin. And the effects of that also take a place immediately upon the soul. What are the effects of mortal sin? So as we said at the outset, it kills the soul. Grace no longer lives within us. We are no longer considered friends of God. We are his enemy now. We have lost out on heaven because of the fact that we've thrown it away. We've dis disregarded all the things that are good in this world by committing moral sin, and thus we lose out by our own choice on heaven if we were to die in that state. Also accompanied with that is the loss of all past merits that we have gained for ourselves. And in addition, any future merits that might be gained by good actions committed while we remain in that state. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't do good things, even if we find ourselves in that unhappy state of mortal sin. No, absolutely not. It's not, first off, you know, just because we've done one bad thing doesn't mean we should do two bad things. That doesn't make really any sense either. But secondarily, the good actions that we commit can gain us some actual graces that might draw us more quickly and more heartfelt, uh, in a heartfelt manner towards repentance and towards contrition and towards amendment of life to help us continue our own spiritual growth and get us back in that state of grace that we need for our souls. So, but we, any kind of merit that we might gain by good actions uh, are, are lost uh, by the state of mortal sin. Thirdly is the state, is the temporal punishment due to us because of mortal sin, even after we are forgiven. That's why all throughout the no November we commemorate the holy souls in purgatory, we pray for them with, by specific devotion towards those souls in purgatory, because you, they, perhaps there are many that had their sins forgiven, but had not worked off all of that temporal punishment due towards sin. But with any kind of problem, there's also the remedy to the problem. You see, we're all here and we have one thing in common amongst all of us. We're, we're alive today. We have the ability to get you to either maintain our, our own sanctifying grace or restore our sanctifying grace to ourselves in order to be in that, to, to have that mortal sin gone. And we have the ability to work to overcome that aspect of our lives. So how do we do so? Well, there are a number of remedies for it, and these are some of the, the most practical and common things that are best applied. Some of the, the, the things that we can say are, are our surest way to overcoming our tendency towards mortal sin. First is the frequent perception of the sacraments. Go to confession regularly. Go to communion regularly. Confession is the only means by which mortal sin is removed from our souls anyways. And uh, communion gives us those graces that we need to, in order 
to be strengthened against the next temptation to come. And those sacraments, that, the, the sacramental graces that come to us by by frequent confession and, and regular communions are the best means by which we are able to keep ourselves out of sin. Or if we have things that we habitually fall into despite our efforts, it's the way in which we will slowly but surely grow to be able to be more successful day by day against those particular common faults that we have. Secondarily is a frequent resolve against sin. When we come to confession, what do we do? We make an act of contrition there. We, we promise that we are going to do our best to not only to, to leave these sins behind, but to try to amend our lives for the future. We don't need to just make an act of contrition when we're in the box, though. We can do it as regularly as we want to. Yes, we should do it actually every single day in the evening time, reflecting upon our daily faults, our, even if they be slight, in a way of continuing, continuing to resolve ourselves one day at a time, one instant at a time, in order to con continue fighting that fight for our souls. So renewing the resolve to fight against what we know is lurking around the corner, temptation, is an important aspect, an important remedy for us to be able to overcome tendency towards sin. Thirdly, daily prayer. So important. Any aspect of good done is done by the aid of grace from God. And if we expect to be able to be successful day after day in fighting against temptation, it's only because day after day we continue to ask for those graces, that we continue to pray to the one source of grace, God himself, and that in doing so, giving honor and glory to him, continually raising our hearts, minds, and souls up to heaven, it helps us and strengthens us in order that when that temptation comes to us, we are able to reject it and leave it aside. Fourthly, Spiritual reading, filling our minds with the good and pious thoughts, showing ourselves readily again and again the examples of the saints who lived her by a way of heroic virtue, so we're better able to imitate them. Seeing in our spiritual reading about the spiritual life the, the solutions to perhaps the difficulties that we have in our day-to-day -day aspect. That spiritual reading fills us with a daily food that can strengthen our souls. And fifthly, penance, sacrifices, being willing to make that action of mortifying ourselves. That strengthens our resolve. That gains for us great spiritual graces. That unites our body along with our hearts, minds, and souls by our, for our prayers. So those things as simple and as obvious as they may seem, are our ready-at-hand remedies against mortal sin in that daily fight. And it's for that purpose that the season of Advent is so important for us to focus on. It is a time of penance. It is a time of sacrificing. It is a time of spiritual growth for ourselves. In history, it was always a time that was set aside like Lent of fasting. In those early days of the church, Advent fast would begin on the Feast of St. Martin on the 11th of November and carry all the way through till Christmas. And in those old days, fasting was a, took on a little bit of a different form than it does now. It was much harder. In Lent, they weren't just required to eat two small meals and a large meal but rather they couldn't start eating until after Vespers came. And when they did, they were not allowed to eat any meat whatsoever, no fish, no eggs, no dairy, no olive oil, no alcohol. It was all part of the Lenten fast of the early church. And in Advent, the fast was similar, though a bit eased because it wasn't as penitential quite as much as Lent was. So while you still were not able to eat until after Vespers, and you still weren't able to eat meat or fish and things like that, you were allowed dairy and, and eggs 
and olive oil. In time, the Advent fast and the mandatory aspect of it fell away, and the church no longer required of souls. And for the most part, many people think, well, that's good, I don't have to worry about it then. But we miss the point in that regard, because it is still a penitential season. We still wear the purple for all of the Sundays during this time. And with that type of spirit, we can see Advent for what it really is, a great opportunity to work on our own faults in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Because we are guilty of that of the same type of sin as the early people the, before the coming of Christ the first time are. And we need that redemption just as much as they did. And so we work on our faults in that expect, that spirit of expectation there, and we see that while we're not mandated particular sacrifices, it only allows us to choose our sacrifices to best suit our own selves to best aid us in our own individual spiritual growth and overcoming the faults that are common to us as an individual. So perhaps these are a few suggestions for you if your common fault happens to fall into one of these type of common categories. First off, for everybody, it's always a good thing to put in the mind of that source of spiritual aid. If you are able to, come to an extra Mass or two throughout the week when they are available. There's no greater source of grace than God himself there upon the altar, ready to be intimately united to you through Holy Communion. And if you can't come, and if it's impossible, whether your work or your distance prevents you from doing so, try to be more conscious of making spiritual communions, uniting yourself by will to that same sacrifice of the altar that takes place every single day. Also, a good resolve that if you don't already make use of regular reception of the sacrament of confession, perhaps during this time is a good time to really try to focus on being consistent in going to the sacrament of penance. Next, as a suggestion, would be to increase spiritual reading or to implement spiritual reading if you don't already do so every day. This is a perfect use of time. This is a good use of that downtime in which sees temptation come so readily. So if a person is given towards idleness, towards slothfulness, or towards sins against the flesh and lust, Spiritual reading is a perfect remedy for that because we take that time when it's most likely to come to us, those temptations, and we fight against it by something pious, and we fill our minds with thoughts that are improving and beneficial and helpful and encouraging in that way. It's a perfect season, and it's almost even expected by the world for us, which aids us in being beneficial, for making acts of charity. This is a great remedy for those whose faults are towards either anger or judgment. If you are quick to judge or you're quick to be angry, put yourself out there and go beyond your own self and try to do something good for those around you. A simple, small act of charity does great things to strengthen the soul in fighting against that next temptation of, that comes to be quick to judge or quick to anger. Or another one would be think of this time as an opportunity for spiritual prayer. Find a devotion that you particularly like and implement it and, and, and kind of make your own resolve to pray it every single day. Add a, one devotion to your prayer life. A great remedy for those who are lacks in their own spiritual life, their own devotion, their own prayer life, or perhaps are not as uh, consistent in giving that honor and glory that is required of us to God. The graces returned to us will help strengthen our soul more and more. By utilizing these type of remedies or anything else that you may find that fits into a similar type of category, by attacking what we know to be our own prominent faults in our lives, we 
continually strive to be the children of light. We continue to cast off those works of darkness, mortal sin, sin in general. We continually reject temptation. And this is why the liturgy of the church is so rich in aiding our souls. We follow the spirit of the liturgy. We follow and implement and live that liturgy. We find it provides for all of our needs in our spiritual life. We rejoice. We glorify God. We, we, we were, are reminded to love Him when those joyous occasions, like the Feast of the Nativity, come along. And that aspect is easy for us to see. You can't help but be happy on such a wonderful day as Christmas. But how much more will we be able to rejoice and how much more perfectly will we love and serve God when that season comes if we take the time now to try to better remove a little bit more of that inclination towards sin? and to better strengthen our souls in order to be continually and always that friend of God and have that light of Christ in our souls so that it stays there all through my life, all the way to my death, and ultimately to be able to possess it forever in heaven. That is the purpose of Advent. Make yours a good and holy one this year. May God bless you again, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.